and that is uh, uh, a library. So I'm talk about the final stress of the Thank you, Radu. Thank you to the committee uh, for the award and for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as Radu alluded, uh, it was a short paper, so I may not take the full time, but uh, I promise to fill this presentation with lots of fun pictures and lots of linear algebra. Uh, and because I promised Gal, I would make this announcement. I have pretty pictures. Gal's presentation had pretty pictures. If you want more pretty pictures, go to the poster session and see Drew's poster. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about linear algebra. Uh, but before I do, uh, this work is brought to you by my fabulous collaborators, Anna Ma and Rayan. Uh, Rayan is in the audience. Anna couldn't make it, so she is with us in spirit. Okay, let's let's talk about let's talk about spheres, right? I, I hand you a sphere, and I ask you draw a hyperplane. So you say fine. I draw a hyperplane, and I say draw another hyperplane. You're like, fine. And I keep asking more hyperplanes, more hyperplanes, draw more hyperplanes. And you're like, why are you telling me to draw so many hyperplanes? Uh, and the reason why is because I am interested in finite frames and recovering signals from quantized finite frame measurements. So this talk has a very fun uh, geometrical application, but also a very nice signal processing application. And I'm going to take liberties to jump back and forth between the two. Uh, so I, I wasn't quite aware of what the context of the audience would be. So I, if I'm going through too basic of things, I hope you don't take it to insult your intelligence. What do I mean by a finite frame? Uh, it's just a spanning set of RD here. And the goal is I have um, some unknown vector x in RD that I would like to recover. And what am I, what am I given? I'm given some signed measurements of inner products with my frames. So I'm just getting plus ones or minus ones. Now, uh, because I'm tossing away so many, uh, so, so much information from just taking the sign, of course, I lose magnitude information. So it's sufficient to just say, I'm trying to find a vector x on the unit sphere in RD. So that's why I told you, think of a sphere. And then the plus one, minus ones here are telling you what side of the hyperplane am I on. And the hyperplane here is the, the orthogonal space to these phi i's. So the picture I want you to have in your mind is X is somewhere on this sphere. You've chopped up the sphere from all these hyperplanes. You have a bunch of great spheres. And X is somewhere on one of these little cells. OK. Ideally, we would find, uh, through some procedure, an estimate of X, X sharp, say, that matched the sign pattern under our frame measurement, our quantized frame measurements for all of our frame vectors. That's called consistent recovery. We're going to be a little bit flexible on this, but terms and conditions may apply. I, I don't want complete garbage estimates, uh, so stay tuned on that. Uh, right. I'm going, to, I'm going to start saying a lot of words here, and just to make sure you understand what I mean when I'm saying these things, I'm going to be very verbose here. So I'm going to define a cell in our spherical tessellation to be the reg any region on a sphere that has sort of a constant bit pattern, just to make sure. So that's what I mean by cell. The other thing is I'm going to define the radius of a set. Maybe it's better to call it a diameter, but I'm just going to use radius. It's just you're going to maximize the distance between the two points in a given set. OK. If we're clear on those things. Let's jump back to the geometry of this problem. So you've, I've handed you this sphere. You've chopped it up nicely for me. You might wonder, well, Eric, how many cells are in this spherical tessellation? Turns out there's a result by uh, a mathematician named Schlafly in the 1800s that says if your frame isn't particularly pathological, in other words, if any subset of D vectors in your frame is a basis, then you can give a, an exact number of how many cells are in the tessellation. It's the sum of binomial coefficients, which uh, asymptotically behaves like M choose D. Okay. Another question you might have well, how many faces? are on a cell in this tessellation, right, um, for, for any cell. Turns out to be an answer for this as well. Cover and Efron give it to you for any frame. Uh, that's nice, right? So it has to be in general position, but there's no distributional assumptions on the vectors. And they say, if you take a cell from this tessellation at random, right, so random draw of the cell, but the frame is allowed to be deterministic, then you can expect on the order of d faces, which is quite nice, OK? Another question you might have, and this is the question that we really care about, at least in the context of recovering a signal from quantized frame coefficients, is how big 
are these cells, right? And the, the measure of big that I care about here is the radius of the cell, right? I'm not, which is proportional to volume, but I'm not interested in the volume for this talk. Uh, there's a result by Vivek Goyal in 1998 that gives us a lower bound for this estimate. It says no matter what frame you decide to take your quantized frame measurements from, the average radius of this spherical tessellation is going to be at least some constant times the inverse of the redundancy of the frame. So redundancy of the frame being m over d. And so this is kind of a crummy lower bound, or at least pessimistic, because you think, well, if I want to have my reconstruction error and recovering x in the worst case, if x is in the biggest cell, I got to double my measurements. And that's a really slow rate of decay. So I'm just putting on the slide what I have said verbally, which is to say, if we're interested in recovering a vector on the unit sphere from these m quantized measurements, our error is going to decay very slowly. Uh, as a teaser for a cool coding corollary that I will mention at the end of my talk, I just want to do a little bit of rate distortion theory here, right? So rate, number of bits we use uh, in our attempts to recover x, distortion is the recovery error. So here, it's if even if it's seemingly obvious, we're using m one-bit measurements to try and recover x. So our rate is m. Our distortion is d over m. So the distortion, the rate distortion trade-off decays like one over x, which is again crummy. We'll improve on that later. Um, so that was a lower bound, right? Didn't necessarily tell us or give us an upper bound for you know how bad can I expect the distortion to be? And to that. Um, we know the answer for Gaussian frames. Um, so instead of putting a randomness on the draw of the cell in our tessellation, I'm going to put randomness on the assumptions of the frame. And then I'm going to characterize all cells in the tessellation. So this is a result uh, proved by Jacques, Laska, Bufanos, and Bernuk in 2015. I'll refer to this result as the JLBB result because it's a lot of names to say. <laughs> but the JLBB basically says, up to log terms, Goyle's lower bound is also an upper bound. Um, and the log term is the extra log m that we're paying over here. And that's with high probability on the draw of your frame vectors. So this result's nice because it's, it's, uh, it complements the result by Goyle. It gives that upper bound that I mentioned before. So it seems like we've, at least in the Gaussian case, have a fairly complete understanding of how bad we can expect our worst case error to be from reconstructing a vector from one bit uh, quantized frame coefficients in the Gaussian setting. We asked the other question at the beginning of this talk, and it had to mention like how many faces are on a cell in the spherical tessellation for a frame. Kind of makes you wonder: Is there an analogous result that we can um, that we can say in the Gaussian setting? But instead of characterizing the average cell, we give behavior about all cells with high probability on the draw of the frame. That's our result. Uh, kind of kind of uh, terms and conditions apply. So in, in simple English, before I show you the theorem, what is our result? Our result basically says, suppose you have a Gaussian frame, so you chop up the sphere with Gaussian vectors, then every cell in your spherical tessellation is effectively up to log terms cut out by D vectors or D faces. Now, you're probably looking at the quotes around effectively. And now, uh, before I show you the theorem, I want to give you a mental picture of what actually I mean here, right? So pretend I give you a Gaussian spherical tessellation. I have some vector x on the unit sphere that I care about. The true cell that x is in may have something like five faces here. The result that we give constructs a set of vectors that's a subset of our frame that cuts out some chunk of the sphere, which may not necessarily be the true cell on the tessellation, but its radius up to log terms will be the same as the true cell. And the, the benefit of the highlighted green cell or the, the set that we give you is that it's a simpler, a potentially simpler cell, right? The true cell could have many, many, many more faces, but we're just saying up to log terms, you could get the same radius with potentially far fewer on the order of D. All right, enough loosey-goosey. 
talking, let me show you the theorem. Okay, what are we doing? Draw m Gaussian vectors and take m to be sufficiently large. We're in the redundant frame setting here. Uh, then I claim with high probability on the draw of your frame vectors, the following is true for all x. So we're characterizing all cells in our Gaussian spherical tessellation. There exists a subset of our frame vectors, which are allowed to depend on the vector x in question. And that subset of frame vectors enjoys the following special properties. The number of vectors in that subset is proportional to d log d log m. No more, no less. And if you have any other vector on the sphere that has the same sign pattern as x coming from that subset, then you're pretty close to the truth. How close to the truth? Well, up to some log terms, order d over m, which is exactly what the JLBB result said. So before I tell you why you should care about such a result, I, I want to at least give you uh, some inspiration or show you what the proof looks like, because this set of the set S sub X uh, actually has some nice geometrical interpretations to it. So we don't just prove a, a willy-nilly existence set, we actually construct it for you. Um, and it, it basically tries to pull vectors from our frame that are in a belt around the perpendicular space of your vector X, right? So if I, if I have a sphere and X is sitting at the North Pole, I wanna try and find vectors in my frame that are as close to being orthogonal to the truth as possible. Because as I wiggle these vectors closer to X perp, these sort of great spheres are gonna be swinging closer to the truth. So you expect those faces to be closer to the truth you're trying to get. So our set's going to look like this. We're going to look at frame vectors whose absolute inner product with the truth is less than some threshold. And we're going to choose that threshold tau very carefully so that we get on the order up to log terms d vectors in it. Once we have chosen that threshold carefully, then we're going to use a whole bunch of nice properties about Gaussians. Rotation invariance is one we use. Small ball tail probabilities show up. Random matrix theory shows up. I'm not going to bother going into all the gory details here. Um, but uh, my heart tells me that this is also true for sub Gaussian frames. And instead of rotation invariance, you're probably going to rely on isotropy here. Small ball tail probabilities will probably follow suit. And the random matrix theory, there's nothing terribly special that we would use about the Gaussian vectors here. We don't bother to generalize to sub Gaussians in the paper. That exercise is left to the reader. Uh, um, but I, want, I at least wanted to give you this intuition that there is this sort of natural geometry that we like to rely on here. OK, I mentioned uh, a little sort of rate distortion trade off that Goyle's result told us. Uh, and it was kind of crummy, right? We had this d over m decay and the distortion, and m was our rate. I claim that this result gives you a much better rate distortion trade-off, at least in theory. So bear with me. So uh, suppose you have some vector x on the sphere, and you have access to the set S sub x as a d log d log n vectors in your frame. And I would like to encode, um, I would like to encode the truth using this data. So how many bits do I need? Well, uh, there are M we need log m choose k bits to encode what vectors from my frame of m total vectors are in s sub x. And we need k bits. I'm using k to denote the cardinality of this subset. We need k bits for each of the one bit measurements coming from vectors in s sub x. And if you find um, if you find a consistent x sharp, or if you fall, if you find an x sharp that satisfies the hypotheses of our theorem, then the distortion is going to decay. Again, I'm using squiggles here, ignoring some log terms in the denominator. Something like Goyle's uh, NJLBB is bound for the distortion. Work a little bit of algebra to solve for the rate as a function of m. Make some substitutions, and what you'll find is we have a root exponential rate distortion trade-off here, which is dramatically much better than Goyle's linear decay in distortion as a function of rate. So celebration, right? This is almost as good as you can expect information theoretically, right? If it weren't root exponential, it would be exponential. That seems, you know, that would be way too good to be true. So do we declare victory and say, we did it. 
we've done a really good job at making one bit measurements, you know, really good at reconstructing the truth. Um, again, we really find this result appetizing. No, Sob Sensei is here to remind us don't be silly. In order to know what vectors are in S of X, you have to know the absolute inner products of X in your frame vector. But we don't know X. So, how can you claim to know which vectors are in this special subset? Well, my colleague Anna raises a good point. We may not be able to actually know the true S sub X, but what if there were to exist an algorithm where we could find some approximation to this set and we didn't have to rely on a priori knowledge of X? That'd be pretty cool, right? Well, uh, I'm going to pull it from on. You say this talk's not long enough for me to tell you about that algorithm. So talk to me afterwards if you want. That's all I got for you. <laughs> I've scared them with spherical tessellations. Yeah, let's see if I can. Yeah, so if we decide beforehand right about the encoder, so the selection of the frame vector, there's no suppose encoder and decoder. Yeah. Then what is exactly the problem? Is there a problem in that case? Uh, so, right. So, what's the problem? Why can't we actually design an encoder to do this? Is because Knowing which vectors of X are in that belt requires knowing the absolute inner products of X. Right, but this is done by the encoder, right? The encoder knows. The encoder knows ah, that. sure, right, right. Yeah, so if, if we had an encoder that had Oracle access to it, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Measure entry state and then log what is inside the binary. That's right, that's right. I guess I'm assuming that I'm also designing the encoder, right? So I, I couldn't do this without a priori knowledge of X. But yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there. Right. There. And basically, what this result is saying is that yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff you don't really care about when you have a really, really redundant frame here, right? The cover and Efron result that says, on average for any frame, you can expect the average cell to have T faces. That was the really enticing thing that made us believe, well, you know, could we do that with high probability for all cells in the Gaussian case? So um, I think there is, in terms of what that would look like beyond these little spherical tessellation cartoons, um, I guess is up to your imagination and your context. I guess um, I am reminded of another thing. So when we were playing around with this problem, it, we were actually a little bit inspired by support vector machines. Um, so this problem is is dual to linear classifiers. So uh, forgive me, I do not want to draw an R3, so I'll draw an R2. So imagine. Um, Instead of recovering an X on our unit sphere, we want to try and recover some hyperplane. And instead of great spheres chopping up the sphere, uh, we have labeled data points, plus or minus one or whatever. And these have to be, at least in this context, they're perfectly separable, right? So this problem is dual to the support vector machine where the data are perfectly linearly separable and that you just replace everything with orthogonal complements. And scaling here doesn't matter, right? If we're only caring about plus one, minus ones, right? The normal vector of the separating hyperplane doesn't change the perf space if I scale it. So that means we can say on the unit sphere, ditto for these points, right? I can scale them away from the origin by any positive scalar constant, so they might as well be modular. So we were really interested in playing around in this context as well. Um, but the... Folks that work in this space seem to be interested in a different measure of error, right? Typically, folks working in this case want to know um, if I draw a 
So let's suppose I have um, all these data points and now I'm trying to find this hyperplane. I found this hyperplane. Now I want to know if I draw a, a new point, what's the probability that I get that wrong? That doesn't manifest itself necessarily as a Euclidean distance like we have. That's more like saying, if I draw a new hyperplane, what's the probability that that hyperplane cuts through the cell that you nominated? Of course, that's going to be related to the sort of volume that this cell outlines, but we were more interested in the sort of classical sense of finite frame coefficients. So we stuck with this radius notion of error. Yeah. Um, I get. Yeah. So one way to think about it is just as uh, sort of specifying cover and Efron's result for Gaussian frames. So. If, oh, I'm not saying that they were, but I'm saying as people who work in the sort of finite frame context, uh, this. One can see that as, uh, I guess, a potential motivation. If you're asking about our motivation in particular, uh, it was because we were interested in designing um, a procedure to recover a vector x from the unit sphere from one bit measurements that had better rate distortion trade offs. So, in other words, let's pretend you're in a context um, where you have lots of frame vectors and you could take a lot of one bit measurements, but maybe it's expensive to actually evaluate those one bit measurements. Wouldn't it be nice if you could cleverly choose which questions to ask to speed up the rate of convergence to the truth? That was the sort of real motivation behind the project. Yeah, and that's the sort of algorithm I teased about but didn't talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. We'll have to Photoshop Anna and. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Eddie. So we'll come back in about 20 minutes and then I'll come in like Mr. Hergen and so Oh, thank you. That was the thing I didn't finish. So I was asking for you to set up now for the ease of work. So you saw the second floor. So what's on that? Okay, that we're going to put the ease of work. Uh, I <laughs> 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 <laughs>